Good afternoon. My name is Alden Landry, and I'm the Assistant Dean for the Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School. And I want to welcome you to, to today's webinar entitled Harvard Affiliated uh, Otolaryngology Residency Programs. The mission of the DICP is to advance diversity, inclusion, and in health, biomedical, behavioral, and STEM fields that builds individual and institutional capacity to achieve excellence, foster innovation, and to ensure equity in a healthy local, national, and global community. Uh, today's program is part of the DICP's Visiting Clerkship Program. For over 30 years, the VCP has been a model for excellence, offering outstanding medical students, particularly those from groups underrepresented in medicine, uh, an opportunity to participate in externships at Harvard Medical School and its affiliated hospitals. Since its inception, over 1,500 students have participated in the program. Each year, we host a series of webinars that bring together members of the Harvard Medical School Residency Programs community, as well as medical students, uh, to share ideas, provide support, and address questions on transitioning to the next stage of medical training. These webinars provide an opportunity to discuss the application process, address questions from students regarding away rotations, as well as any other concerns students may have. Uh, this year's webinars will include neurology, dermatology, otolaryngology, radiology, and urology. The dates for the programs will be listed on the final slide of today's presentation. Uh, you may also find this information available on our website. A couple of quick notes. This webinar is being recorded and a copy will be sent to all participants in addition to being posted on the DICP website. The chat function is turned off. If you would like to ask a question, please post it in the Q&A section. And also we have a very brief survey at the end of the webinar. We would appreciate it if you take a brief moment to fill out the survey before signing off. And now I wanna introduce our panelists because these are the individuals that you want to hear from. And this is the reason why you logged on and you're watching this video today. First is Dr. Stacy Gray, uh, who is an endoscopic sinus and skull based surgeon and an associate professor of otolaryngology at Harvard Medical School. She has been uh, in practice at Massachusetts Eye and Ear since 2005 and serves currently as the Sinus Center Director here. She also functions as the Associate Rhino, uh, Rhinology Endoscopic uh, Surgery Base Fellowship Director and the ORL Residency Program Director and the Vice Chair of Education for the ORL Department. Uh, next is Dr. Uh, Sharuk Jalisi. He is the Chief of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, his clinical interests include head and neck cancers and tumors, endocrine surgery, robotic surgery, oral cancer, skin cancers, open and endoscop uh, endoscopic uh, skull-based surgery, pituitary resections, acoustic tumors, and local and microvascular reconstruction of the head and neck. Prior to joining BIBMC, Dr. Jalisi was, the, was instrumental in the development of the Boston Medical Center, Boston University Head and Neck cancer surgery program, which focuses on delivering care to underprivileged patients. He was also involved in the launch of the first robotic surgery program for head and neck uh, cancer in New England. Thank you too for being here and joining us for this discussion. And I wanna turn it over to you now. And um, Sharuk, I'll turn it over to you first to give a brief introduction about the residency program at BIDMC. Uh, thank you, Alden. I think you can hear me now. Um, so our program, uh, the, uh, the Harvard Medical School program at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, uh, we came into existence uh, three years ago now. Uh, we are uh, gearing up to come up into a fourth uh, uh, match cycle. So we're looking for a fourth class, uh, which would start next year uh, in July. Um, we are a full, fully functional program. We are uh, combined with uh, Children's Hospital uh, for the pediatric part of it. Otherwise, all the adult rotations happen at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, we have eight faculty and counting. We're going to be recruiting a bunch more. We are a growing program. Um, we are very pretty much well-rounded in all the specialties. Um, we have a research, a pretty robust research group that started with our young faculty. We're really proud of the diversity amongst our fa faculty who come from uh, different uh, institutions um, and have done a tremendous job building this uh, program and are great mentors uh, for the residents. 
Uh, from an education perspective, uh, we do have a two-year uh, rotating uh, educational curriculum for the residents uh, that you go through. And as you get uh, more senior, uh, we expect you to be leading uh, a lot of the seminars. It's more of a seminar format rather than a lecture format uh, with uh, questions and answers. And our uh, associate program director, Dr. James Naples, has been instrumental in developing that. Uh, at the same time, we have a pretty robust medical student interest group and a curriculum, again, uh, under the leadership of Dr. Naples uh, to help our medical students. Um, and then we do research, uh, plenty of projects going on for research where the residents get involved, uh, as well as the medical students. Uh, the, that's really the, the nuts and bolts of this. Uh, from a uh, residency training perspective, uh, since we are a young program, uh, there are no chief residents per se. There's no fours and fives right now. We're building up to it. So it does allow for a very early operative experience for the residents uh, or the incoming uh, potential residents uh, with uh, our PGY ones and twos are in the operating room doing head and neck procedures and neurotology cases and uh, sinus cases and so on and so forth. Uh, so obviously I think that will pay dividend as time goes on and as as our uh, junior residents become senior residents. Uh, they will uh, be great colleagues. And as I always say, uh, giving senior residents, you know, give the give ca cases up to the junior residents. Um, obviously, it comes with its challenges. You know, we are a new program. So, you know, we have a, a very robust APP group, advanced practitioner group, PAs and NPs that provide help support uh, the floors and even cover calls. So because we can only have the residents do so much, we fully follow the 80 hour work week. Uh, so it's been an exciting journey thus far. We uh, we do have our didactics, uh, and then we have uh, some of the things like temporal bone course and anatomy course that we do with uh, Boston University and Tufts uh, Medical Center as well. Uh, so all in all, we're growing. We are looking forward to uh, seeing uh, uh, more candidates and uh, uh, get the best uh, folks we can get to train at Harvard Medical School. Awesome. Thanks Thank for you. that introduction. Uh, Stacy, tell us about your program. So um, I'll first out, start out by just saying that um, within the Harvard uh, Department of Otolaryngology, we're really lucky because we have actually a huge department that crosses all of the institutions. And so that includes um, our colleagues at the BI. So as a, as a academic department, we all function very well together. And our residents used to rotate at um, Beth Israel Deaconess up until the residency there was created. So we're a, we're a close knit faculty sort of at the, at the department level. Um, our training program now um, is centered at Mass Ioneer and Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, and we also have a rotation at Children's Hospital like Dr. Jalisi mentioned. Um, our residency program has five residents every year, um, and one of those residents each year will be doing an extra two years of training as part of a T32 uh, research uh, training track. So there, that's one resident every year. So at any one time, we have two residents that are doing research, and those two years of research are conducted after the PGY2 year. So we have a total of 27 residents um, in our program. Um, we have a fair number of fellows as well at, that are mainly at, uh, housed at Mass Ioneer um, and a fairly large faculty at Mass Ioneer, including a very large suburban group of practicing otolaryngologists that practice comprehensive otolaryngology throughout the greater Boston community, um, but bring their uh, surgical cases to Mass Ioneer. I think the biggest thing that's unique about our program is that there are a very small number of freestanding um, Ioneer hospitals that function as a hospital in the United States. Um, and Mass Ioneer is one of them that uh, continues in that vein. So we have our own freestanding hospital that uh, only does um, surgery for ophthalmology and otolaryngology. Um, and so that provides a little bit of a unique experience. Uh, we're physically attached to Mass General Hospital, so we're the Department of Otolaryngology for MGH, and so we function very closely with them, but the actual daily workings is, is sort of as a separate institution embedded within a larger clinical hospital. Um, our residents spend 10 weeks every year at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, which has more of a traditional uh, division of otolaryngology within the Department of Surgery. Um, and uh, other than that, we've, it's sort of a long-standing program. I won't get into too many details, uh, just so I know you have a lot of questions for us to answer. Um, but again, it's a, it's a program with a really long history um, and really uh, very much sort of 
uh, dependent on our trainees as a big component of what we do on a daily basis. Looking forward to talking. Awesome. Thank you both for introducing your programs and giving us a heads up on uh, uh, how the programs are similar and how they're different and uh, just a brief overview. Now we're going to really dive into some questions and uh, talk about the application process, learning more about residency programs, and then thinking about the next steps that many students are going to be doing as they're moving forward uh, with uh, their careers and uh, going from medical student to hopefully uh, interns and residents in the next few years. Stacey, I want to stick with you. Speaking from a program director spec, uh, perspective, what are your overall thoughts about uh, how this application cycle will be different than the years prior, and how are you preparing for this upcoming cycle? Oh, no, I think I, I always forget to unmute, unmute my. There have been a lot of changes, obviously, over the last several years. Um, Am I frozen? Yeah, you're, you're fine now. You're okay. fine now. <laughs> Sorry. There have been a lot of changes um, over the last several years be that were mainly precipitated by COVID. Um, and obviously, we're still living in a situation where um, it appears that interviews will be done virtually again for this um, upcoming cycle. Our um, otolaryngology program director's organization has not made an official statement to related to that um, sort of coming from the AAMC. Um, but specifically for, for our program, we know that we will be sticking with a virtual format for interviews this year. The other big change is obviously related to step one scores. And um, so from the standpoint of our program, um, we actually have not been using step one scores for the last three years. Um, as part of our screening process or as our actual um, review process for once people are coming for interviews. So we have always just used a pass-fail cutoff related to that because we knew this change was, was coming. And similarly, we obviously know that many people will not have step two scores. And so as, again, for our programs, we've really moved away from using um, using those scores. So I, for us, I don't think it'll be a very big change, but I think those are the biggest sort of on a, on a national level that probably are impacting um, applications this year. Jarok, you mentioned earlier uh, about the engagement with the medical students, um, and I'm sure you're hearing some concerns uh, about this upcoming app application cycle. What are some of the biggest concerns that you're hearing from students and maybe um, how many of these are sort of um, unwarranted or unneeded? So, uh, so Alden, as uh, Stacy said, I think the big thing on students' minds was how it's now that step one has become pass fail. How is that going to work out? So that's obviously the first one. So we do the same thing um, as uh, Stacy's program, which is we've done a holistic review. Again, being a newer program, we've always done a holistic review where we uh, really become blind to uh, these board scores. And having said that, I'm pretty sure in the rest of the country as a whole. Step two will take probably a greater precedence, uh, but step one is going to be pass fail. So a lot of your application, the meat of the application, which I think we're going to talk later, is going to be important to demonstrate. Uh, that's where I tell the students is going to demonstrate who you are as a person and uh, if a, a program is going to invite you for an interview. So that's one. Second, obviously, on everyone's mind always is um, the, the high unmatch rate in otorengology and several of the subspecialties. But I think that uh, uh, for, for, for candidates who are really interested in this specialty, I think that shouldn't be on your mind. Uh, work hard, get a good application and, and uh, show up for your interviews. Uh, and uh, rest will just uh, 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 work itself out. So I think uh, that's another concern, anxiety provoking concern. Uh, the, the, the last part of this is, uh, as Stacy said about virtual interviews and what do I do with away rotations? And that's on everyone's mind. So again, we don't know if we're gonna be doing live interviews or virtual. I think there's a, a big dichotomy still now that we're used to virtual interviews that there's a benefit to it. It also is a benefit to the students. Um, where you know they don't have travel, there's a, there's low expense. Uh, downside is you know uh, uh, the students are unable to see the program that they're interviewing with. You know there's no touch and feel kind of thing. I think there are second looks at, at various places. Uh, it all depends on how you set that up. Uh, if you can actually come in physically, but all of it will be governed by the existing um, policies that the hospitals have. We at BI are a big general hospital, so we have to go with whatever the hospital decides uh, is going to be the interaction. So I think those are big ones. And then away rotation, again, a lot of students ask, should I do away rotation? 
Uh, as uh, Stacy again mentioned, we are at Harvard, we are lucky where the students can rotate at least two different hospitals uh, with, uh, with their own residency programs, but a lot of programs only, a lot of universities only have one program. Uh, but I, I believe if you can get into an away rotation to an area that you really want to go uh, explore and it's far geographically far away from where you currently are, I think it's worthwhile as long as you do a good job because they can backfire if you don't do a good job. So, so those are the really three main concerns that I'm hearing right now from the students uh, about the application process. Awesome. Thank you. And I think we're going to try and unpack a couple of those comments that you uh, just made uh, further down with the, some of the other questions that I'm, I'm planning to ask. Uh, but I want to get to a question that's really important to us with the work that we're doing with the DICP. Uh, and I know that many of the hospitals are taking seriously and as we uh, work to address issues related to DEI. Uh, Stacy, can you tell me what your program is doing to address issues related to DEI across your program? Sure. Um, before I do that, actually, I just wanted to mention actually a few things that are really for DEI across the country, um, because I, the first thing I'm just going to say is that it's really important to understand that our field as a whole has a problem um, with this issue. And um, I think the really wonderful and fortunate thing is that the majority of leaders in all of the programs across the country have recognized this and really actually want to change it. So our program alone cannot make the change because if only 5% of our applicants um, that are applying across the country fit into uh, a UIM category, we will never be able to in our own program actually make a change more than that. So I think for all of us, really what we're trying to do at the medical school level is to allow students to learn about our field early on and get people interested and invested. And there are several organizations nationally who have really made, made this something that is an, is an imperative for them. So I just want everyone who's listening to know about this because there are several initiatives that allow for stipends for students to do away rotations, which is, I think, a huge, huge part of how students get interested in otolaryngology and have the potential and ability to be able to go see another program. So one is the Society of University Otolaryngologists, SUO, um, and they have a UIM specific um, uh, sort of program that you can apply to early in the year. The applications are usually due in April to provide a stipend for an away rotation. Similarly, the AAOHNS, which is the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, also has a similar program as well. And so for all of our students that we're advising, especially really early in medical school, um, this is one of the things that we talk about because not only is it a great way to get financial support for doing away rotation. It also is an amazing way to, to sort of develop mentorship because a lot of these organizations, the committees that sort of review the applications provide that even if you're not actually awarded um, the stipend. Um, they're also through SUO, there's a whole listing of specific programs and departments that are specifically interested in this issue. And there are many institutions who also provide support for students that are coming to their institution and it's all listed on the SUO website. So this is something that is really near and dear to my heart with our own program. But again, I feel like really the way that we're making a difference is trying to actually access first year students, especially. So people will learn about otolaryngology. And so we have a much more diverse applicant pool to start with. Specifically within our program, I think the biggest thing is that both our chair and our department leaders are really invested in this topic. And so it's something that um, we are very fortunate that there are a lot of programs that we're doing um, within the community, especially from the standpoint of patient outreach that um, has highlighted this. And it allows residents who really are sort of focused on this from a research standpoint and also a health equity standpoint. We have a lot of students that are applying now that this is sort of their area that they're interested in working on. So we're really fortunate that we have a lot of faculty that actually this is sort of, not only is it something that they're kind of interested in, it's actually their area of scholarship and expertise. So I could go on talking about this literally for the whole hour and I don't want to, um, but I, I will just say that, you know, it's not just about our program, it's about our field as a whole and we need to do a better job. Uh, you know, I really appreciate that because I think we often 
have a very uh, narrow view of our role within uh, issues related to DEI, whether it's what we can do at our institution or what we're doing at our uh, residency program without having that global understanding that there are other issues that are at play and we need to think about this longitudinally, we need to think about this you know, across the country. So thank you for, for sharing that. Sharuk, I would like to offer you an opportunity to answer that question as well. Thoughts on what your program uh, is doing to address DEI issues related to um, um, uh, BI or just uh, across uh, across the country? Thank you, Alden. So uh, so I echo what uh, Dr. Gray said about our, our uh, otorengology and our um, ac uh, academic society is doing a lot of push for improving DEI. Uh, within the division, I think I, I, I have to uh, uh, preface it by the BI, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, I think has been really pushing DEI stuff uh, through leaders like yourself, Alden, to really improve the DEI. And we work with the uh, Harvard Medical School pretty closely. Uh, I think we became one of the first Department of Surgeries where a DEI committee was established. Um, and then that's been working. So from a divisional perspective, uh, you know, we, we, we've we embraced DEI. We, we do a lot of... Uh, um, in, in implicit bias and team building uh, projects with our teams. Uh, we have really improved the diversity mix of our division itself, including all our staff. I'm not talking about faculty or residents, but all our staff. We are high. Uh, uh, we we brought the uh, gender equity into into this. We have a, a big racial mix uh, into this as well. Uh, so I think diversity is very important. We believe in that. All of us do that. It brings uh, the spice of life in there. Uh, for every recruitment, we have a one of our DEI members. So we have two uh, a really good young faculty, Dr. Gomez and Dr. Tang. Uh, Dr. Gomez is actually going to be the co-chair of the uh, Department of Surgery uh, DEI committee. He also heads up our DEI uh, thing for our program. Our academic department, Dr. Gray said, we are a unified academic department. Uh, we established a, uh, a unified DEI committee across, which is which has representation from all the affiliated hospital for the department, which is Mass Ionia, Brigham, uh, Brigham and Women, Children's, and BI. So that's another thing we're doing at the departmental level. Uh, divisional level, we have uh, uh, a DEI committee member on all our recruitments. We actually uh, do repeated training on implicit and unconscious bias. Uh, before the interviews, we really do a lot of education for our faculty and those who interview stu uh, students uh, about this, uh, the, these things and, and challenges that we have and opportunities to improve. So that's on a, on a divisional level. From a patient perspective, uh, you know, Beth Israel is a very big uh, general hospital. BI Lehi Health is now a 15 uh, uh, hospital system. Uh, and as part of our uh, merger agreement is we take care of a lot of the underprivileged uh, folks. I, my previous life was at Boston Medical Center, which is the largest safety net hospital. And BI, uh, we last, uh, last I talked to Juan Lopera, who's the uh, VP of diversity for the whole network. We're close to, I think, Alden, correct me if I'm wrong, close to about 30% of our patient population is either underprivileged uh, that we manage. So from a patient mix for the residents, you're gonna see everything, uh, at, at least in our institution where there's a lot of uh, uh, underrepresented minorities. It also allows you to learn about how to manage that patient or discharge in a multidisciplinary setting and how to get them from hospital back to home where they may not have the luxuries uh, uh, that will provide a comfortable life. So our social workers and everything, we're blessed to have a great service. Uh, so we're working on DEI on all fronts, uh, you know, patient care, uh, re uh, resident recruitment, any recruitment per se, and at a, department, a departmental level, we're really blessed to have some awesome colleagues and I'm really proud of everyone for what they do. Awesome, thank you both for um, answering that question. I think it's really important for a lot of our listeners uh, to get a better understanding of uh, what's happening uh, with diversity, uh, both at the hospitals and again at the national level. I want to maybe jump a little bit more into the career selection process and learning more about programs. Um, Sharuk, uh, there may be students who are watching this video um, who are not going to be in the application cycle just yet, um, but they're interested in a career in otolaryngology or ENT or RL. Um, how do they know if this is the right specialty for them? And what tips do you have for students who are earlier in their career path, uh, earlier in medical school? Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. And uh, Alden, I talk to students, no matter what specialty they do, I always encourage them uh, that don't be, uh, you know, uh, dazzled by what you're seeing, maybe going into operate with Dr. Gray and she's doing skull-based work or me doing head and neck work. 
but rather see what uh, what you want for lifestyle afterwards. So I always tell them to look at someone who's at least 10 years out of their practice, no matter what specialty they're doing. They could be doing medicine, cardiology, ER, whatever. And then see if it jives with your uh, goals in life. I think that's important. We see too many doctors out there who go through training and just don't like what they're doing. And then they want to do a career switch, which becomes very hard, especially nowadays. I mean, in the old days, you know, you could do two residencies, three residencies, not a problem. But now it's a problem. So it's look at. I highly encourage look at folks if you're looking at it uh, a, a particular specialty. Go see what people are doing ten years down the road. Um, for men and women, I tell them go talk to uh, different gender uh, attending, see what their life is, so you can get a full full idea. Uh, ordering the OG obviously is a big question. So the first question really becomes is do you want to do surgery? I think that is the question. That's uh, do you really want to do surgery? Are you are you tuned up to the challenges? And again talking to people out there or looking at your mentors in your institutions will help you with that. Beyond that, ordering OG again, is there a hook in there? What made you think about ordering OG? Why do you want to do this? Because there's a lot of surgical specialties out there. So think about it. And then uh, lastly, I would say be uh, realistic. I always tell my uh, uh, students, be realistic about getting into ordering OG, you know, uh, the, the, uh, and look at the competition around you. Uh, you know, we, we're one of the uh, one of the top uh, rated specialties at this point in time. I, I don't want to uh, tweet our own or toot our own horn here, uh, right, Dr. Gray? And but but be realistic. You know, talk to your mentors. Make sure you know you you, you have everything to get in. Uh, and and if not, how can you improve your application to have a better chance? Uh, but that's those are the big things. Uh, uh, make sure you you go committing to the correct. Uh, uh, specialty. And, uh, you know, it could be anything. Uh, I, I love, I've, I've come from a family of physicians and we have one of everyone in our family. So, so <laughs> it's a, interesting conversations. Awesome. Thank you for that. And it's quite all right to toot your own horn about uh, how amazing your specialty is. Uh, uh, I have a lot of fun when I host this for emergency medicine. It's just, it's like a family reunion. So I, I have no problem with that. Um, Stacy, I want to go to you because one of the sort of integral parts about um, uh, the application process to residency for many specialties is away rotations. And Sharuk uh, alluded to this earlier. Um, that's how some students come and they, you know, perform well for a residency program. But there's some pros and cons to it. Can you talk to us about what are the pros and what are the cons of, with away rotations? Sure. And I'm just going to echo uh, one thing that Dr. Jalisi just said related to sort of advising medical students which is that it is really, really important to have a mentor that knows you personally. And the sooner that you have that person um, sort of in the, in the year that you're thinking you're at about your application, that's absolutely the most important thing. And for most people, that means someone at your home institution. But we all know that there are programs that, for instance, don't have an otolaryngology training program. Um, and so there are a lot of different opportunities to then find a mentor, but you need someone who is really familiar with the application process and really understands what other programs are actually looking for so they can specifically advise you. Because when we talk on, on sort of this level, it's really hard because everyone is coming to the table with a different sort of portfolio. And so how you make that portfolio shine for you is really the job of the mentor. And there are, you know, at every program, no matter where you are, there's always one or two people that this is like the main thing that they love doing. And we all love our field as, you know, we, I will toot our horn as well. Um, we, we love our field and we want to get students excited about it. We want students to match into it. We want to make sure it's really the right field for them. And that mentorship aspect of things is the most important part when it comes. And that's true of OA sub eyes. So first of all, one of the cons, they're super expensive. Um, it's really a challenge and we totally understand that, especially coming to Boston, it's hard because it's hard to find a place to live for a month. It's hard, parking is hard. Everything is a little bit complicated about being in this city. And so before you, you embark on that, one, you really wanna make sure that it's worth your while. So part of the pro of doing an away rotation is you get to see the program up close and personal. So in addition to sort of doing a, a month long interview or a month long audition, you also get information about whether or not you would really want to train there or not. And so that's really, I think, one of the positives about doing it. It also gives you as a student a chance to interact with other students that are on the rotation and it gives you a chance to sort of really sort of get access to other mentors that are outside of your home institution. So the decision about whether or not to do an away rotation, I think really has to do with 
why you would be doing it personally and whether or not it's going to be a good choice. And I think your mentor is really the right person to ask about that. Awesome. Uh, and uh, just keeping along with this, this theme, you know, students, they may be interested in doing a rotation, but they can't. And some of them may be concerned that is a, a struggle for them um, or, and it's going to potentially hurt their application. Uh, so, Sharuk, um, for those who can't rotate with us, is there value in, in reaching out to a residency program before the application process, either to uh, a resident in the program, uh, program uh, leadership, or even other faculty within the residency? So I think if you're targeting a program, a potential uh, uh, program to uh, to come to or try to get an interview, it is it is beneficial for to get some kind of contact going. Uh, what we've seen in the last few years is, you know, this could be by virtue of uh, communicating with our associate program directors about uh, engaging in our educational curriculum. Uh, other times, uh, getting a research project started, which could be virtual or remote. Uh, we, we have not set up a virtual uh, rotation in our uh, division as yet. Uh, there are other surgical divisions like neurosurgery, which has had a very successful virtual rotation. And I think Alden, your group has a virtual rotation as well, which has been very successful. We're learning, we're trying to learn from uh, our partners at BI on how to do this and uh, how to really execute it. So it's possible we might we might have something. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Gray has one, but I, I believe you do. Uh, but uh, but several programs may have a virtual rotation. Uh, so, but engaging with the with a potential program, I think, has its benefits. Uh, reaching out to residents, I think, never hurts, especially if you know someone. But we can always get you in touch with the residents so you can chat with them and see what the program is. And that's where I think this whole virtual thing has taken away a lot, where you can't really have uh, a brick and mortar kind of feeling for the program. Uh, but, you know, there are students who will visit, but uh, again, it, it's all governed by the hospital policies at that time, if they will allow uh, visitors to come in or not. Uh, but yes, I think it's it's a value to to get to know each uh, each other and then go from there. Uh, and, uh, and maybe Dr. Gray can talk about it, but we do have a, and under her leadership at the SCO, there's a token system that was started for Otorangology. Maybe Dr. Gray, you can shed a, a couple of uh, minutes on that, uh, because that's a very good way to, uh, to indicate your um, preference for a program. So I'll let Dr. Gray uh, talk about that more. So uh, thanks, uh, Shrook. Um, the, the token system, for those of you who don't know, is uh, essentially run through the SUO and Otolaryngology Program Directors Organization. And students have the opportunity to issue programs for tokens. So they essentially pick the four, four programs that they are most highly interested in. And the programs receive those tokens prior to the application review cycle. So essentially, it's a way to sort of give another piece of information about yourself to the program so that when they're reviewing your application, they know that you're specifically interested in that program. Two caveats with that. If you do an away rotation or program or your home program, you should not offer them a signal that you're, you're not supposed to. So you don't actually uh, do that. And everyone knows that that's part of the rules because your home program, you, you imply interest by being there. And if you do an away rotation, it's essentially the same. So you don't use your, you don't use your signals on those programs. Um, we've been doing this now for, this will be, I think the third year that we're doing this and we're collecting a lot of data really to try to see if it is actually helpful for both applicants and the programs. And one thing I want to just add, um, and this is, again, a shameless plug uh, for the visiting clerkship program. Uh, as I mentioned in the introductions, we've been around for um, over 30 years, accepting students from across the country to come and rotate with us. Uh, it's been a great way for us to bring residents, uh, trainees, medical students in, uh, to get those um, externships, to be in the hospitals, to get to know Boston, to see the city. One of the things that makes our program unique is the offer to, um, um, uh, in addition to offering a stipend to cover your housing and support for your travel. We also make sure that you have uh, mentorship while you're here. Uh, and have some additional resources uh, and opportunities to see the different hospitals uh, from different perspectives. So please consider applying to the visiting clerkship program, come and rotate with us. Um, we are still accepting applications for the later months, uh, but you're, you know, this is definitely an opportunity to take advantage of. And the other thing that we do is something that we started about eight years ago and even continued throughout the pandemic was our residency showcase, which is an opportunity for, uh, for students uh, to interact with medical, uh, to uh, interact with other medical students, to interact with 
uh, trainees here at the Harvard hospitals and also to meet program directors and other faculty. And so these are two additional opportunities that we provide for students um, to make sure um, that they are um, getting to know our programs before they apply um, and having to do the, you know, addressing the issues related to tokens or thinking about that post that pre-communication phase uh, to the uh, application process. Uh, Stacey, going back to you, uh, one thing that we want to talk about for students is away rotations are important, but what are some of the other things students need to have done on their application, especially when it comes to their clinical rotations before they're ready to apply to residency? So I think the absolute most important is your, for those people who are at a home institution that have their, have a home program, um, is doing the otolaryngology rotation. And for almost all, all schools who don't have an actual like home program, they have a relationship with another hospital that does. And so whatever the relationship hospital is, they enfold those students in the same way that they would their own students. So that again, that aspect of mentorship. So that I think is the most important part really of the application because the uh, truthfully, I think one of the strongest components of what we look for as program directors are the letters of recommendation. And so the letters of recommendation that are coming from the otolaryngologist in your home program is going to be the most significant component of the application. I think the rest of it, um, there are a lot of other things that you can sort of talk about and, and again, with the help of your mentor, help to figure out how to highlight them, whether it's on your CV or in your personal statement. Um, but performance on your um, otolaryngology rotation is by far the most important thing. Awesome. And I, I just want to highlight the, you know, I've heard you all talk about mentors and mentorship throughout this conversation. And I don't think it could be um, underscored enough how important it is to have strong mentorship as you're going through, you know, any um, major decision like this, whether it's choosing a specialty, applying to a specialty, and then when you're in the specialty, making sure that you're building yourself up um, and putting yourself in a position to be successful going forward. So thank you for just doubling down on the importance of mentorship in this conversation. Um, Sharuk, uh, can you uh, speak um, again on how a PD is going to assess students from a clinical rotation perspective? What information are you looking for um, when assessing a student on their clinical rotations, including those away rotations? So I think there are two parts of it is one, how do we assess students who rotate with us, so whether it be a, 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 a within, within, within the university rotation or away rotation. So there are several parts to it. Uh, all our sub-internships are four weeks long. Uh, the students are obviously spend time on the head and neck service, which is where the bulk of the surgery happens, a couple of weeks on that. And then they spend time in the clinic and with all the, pretty much to rotate with all the faculty. Um, what we're looking for is really how, how they perform uh, both in the operating room and outside of it, uh, understanding the basic uh, knowledge of otolaryngology. We, we obviously don't expect people to be uh, trained otolaryngologists coming in, but you know, no, no knowledge. Show uh, motivation and show the desire to learn. Uh, at the end of it all, we do, at the end of the rotation, you, you do have a presentation to all the faculty on a, a topic of your choosing that's otolaryngology related. So all that factors into your uh, evaluation. Uh, second part of it is when you are reading, uh, uh, and I'm assuming this is the other question Alden is asking is, uh, how do we interpret clinical rotation evaluations uh, on an application? And, and I think that therein becomes important uh, for various rotations. I mean, important ones are obviously the basic ones you would do, which is part of the core curriculum, which is surgery, medicine, pediatrics, uh, and, and other things. So don't underestimate any of your rotations. Please uh, uh, perform well and give it all your best. Um, uh, any kind of sub -inter sub internships, if you if you have the benefit of having an otolaryngology program at home, if you're coming to us for a visiting student, uh, then we do, uh, uh, or or going somewhere for as a visiting, we do look at those reviews as well from your away rotations as part of your application packet. Um, so again, as uh, Dr. Gray said, this could be a double-edged sword. You go somewhere and don't perform well and get a mediocre evaluation, that's problematic. Uh, I'm being very blunt and honest about it. Uh, so make sure you do well, work with uh, a faculty that uh, that uh, uh, are willing to give you a good, good, good evaluation and then go from there. Uh, also in the application packet for those uh, students who do have a home program, it's important to make sure uh, uh, you have some kind of interaction with the leadership in your program and hopefully you can get a letter from them. Uh, that would be very helpful. For those who don't, 
uh, if you're rotating, uh, as Dr. Gray had said, find a mentor and rotating, let's say, in a, even a private office or something like that, uh, make sure that someone can write you a letter and, and be your advocate uh, for these applications. Thank you. And uh, Stacy, you mentioned this earlier about letters of recommendation. Um, so I really want to tease into this a little bit more. Can you talk about letters of recommendation? Um, what should students be doing to secure strong letters of recommendation? And probably more importantly, who should they be asking? So um, you for the otolaryngology application, you can have four letters of recommendation. And um, the first thing I will say is that for almost every program um, and every rotation, there's sort of a traditional person that writes a letter of recommendation. And one of the things is that you can, as a student, you can ask the residents, for instance, who is that sort of at the beginning of the rotation. Whoever provides sort of the grade for the rotation, that's often who will also provide the letter of recommendation. It's sort of the whoever the faculty person is that's serving as a mentor for the sub eyes. Um, and so each program is a little bit different in that way, but there will be one that's sort of one set person that knows they're going to be writing a letter of recommendation for almost every student that comes through. So that's sort of a guarantee. And usually that person has some leadership position within the department. And it might be a combined letter, for instance, with the chair. It might be a combined letter with a program director. That might be actually the same thing. So it's important to sort of know um, who that is going to be. The rest of the letters of recommendation, again, really, it's a conversation with your mentor. So for some people, for instance, they might have done an extra year of research. And even if that research is not in the field of otolaryngology, you might want to secure a letter of recommendation from that person to talk about your um, sort of your qualifications as a researcher. Or you might have spent a year doing an MPH. And so it might be someone completely out of, outside of the field of otolaryngology, but it's really going to add to your, your portfolio by having someone else give a different perspective. And then within um, sort of within the field of otolaryngology, there are often times that you might work with someone for a longer period of time. So you might have a longitudinal relationship with them doing a research project or you might have spent more time um, shadowing them early on, or you might spend more time with them during the rotation. Those are people that you solicit and ask very frankly, are you able to write a strong letter of recommendation for me? And most faculty will be honest. So if they're not going to be able to write a strong letter of recommendation, then they will politely decline. And that means that you will have that conversation with someone else. For myself, when I'm writing a letter of recommendation for students, what I ask them to do is to provide their CV and then also their personal statement that they're going to be submitting. And then we have a meeting sometime in the summer so that I can really make sure that all of the personal attributes that sort of I want to know about them, that that is accurate and that they're comfortable with me sharing any of that information in a letter format. So you, as a student, you can ask the faculty person if they would like that as well and really provide them with all of the information sort of right there so that they're able to really write a strong letter of recommendation for the applicant. Awesome. Thank you for that. And uh, Sharuk, one of the other components of the application is the personal statement. What are you looking for in a strong personal statement? So um, for all the students who are writing, uh, most of us actually read your personal statement. So uh, grammatical errors is a no-no. Okay, so let's make sure it's, it, it flows. Uh, ideally, we're looking for something that tells uh, us about you as a person, why you're doing otolaryngology, uh, what some great things you've achieved in life, I mean, we, uh, shared with us. Um, uh, tell us about it, don't be shy, you know, because that is how we, as, as uh, Dr. Gray said, uh, those are things we're using to figure out your personal attributes. We're also looking at the personal statement as a way to say, is this person going to fit into the culture of our program? And every program has a different culture. Uh, what we are looking for is very different than what Dr. Gray is looking for, which may be very different than what people in uh, Boston University or Michigan or somewhere else are looking for. So all of us have our own needs, and that's why it's called a match. We, we want to create that match. So the personal statement, again, is limited by the number of words and pages you have. Uh, so that's why your writing prowess will come into it, communicate clearly and effectively to tell us who you are as a human being and why you should be here. Uh, there are students out there who do make um, 
institution specific uh, statements as well at the at the end uh, again if you're doing that make sure you know about the program rather than just firing off something random because that doesn't it doesn't sit well with anyone uh, so we really want to know about you through the personal statement and that's really how, I, how we use it uh, during our process awesome and we're going to try and get through these last few questions briefly um, just because of uh, interest of time and we've already partially talked about this conversation, Stacey. So maybe, maybe just do you have any other parting comments about, uh, you know, step one and how ENT or ORL residencies are going to be addressing this? You've already mentioned that your program um, looks at it pass fail regardless, um, but just thinking about this from a global perspective with the with the specialty. So I think um, students have a tendency to really get caught up on the step one score. And I really try to always emphasize to students that it really is just a very small component of your package. So the, the number of programs that really use that as a cutoff has gotten fairly low at this point across, across the specialty. So I think, um, and most of us really are very comfortable now with this idea of a holistic review. So there's only so much you can do to control that don't worry about it so much and spend your time putting effort into the rest of the your portfolio, which is actually way more important, which has to do with your skills as a clinician and as a good um, physician, which involves sort of your compassionate care for patients. And that's reflected in your, um, in your grades in the rest of your rotations, which ultimately is gonna be more important. I wish more people could hear that advice that you just gave, because I think that's a really, really sage advice. Uh, Sharuk, uh, uh, the other component of this exams is step two. Uh, some students may or may not have that when applying um, to residency. Um, how are how is step two um, brought into the discussion when it comes to the application process? So I think uh, we have other ways to assess someone, even if they don't have step two, uh, we're not going to make it mandatory for application to our program. But remember, in Massachusetts, you do need step two prior to graduation. Otherwise, you can't get a limited license. So uh, it's always ideal to have it done. So at least when you're applying to a program, we are sure that at least you've done all the basic things to get a limited license in Massachusetts. Uh, because if you don't, let's, God forbid, you don't take it till the end and you don't pass it, and now you're matched into a program in Massachusetts, it's going to be very difficult to maintain that position. Because one of the uh, criteria for uh, the contracting is that you are able to get licensed in the state of Massachusetts. And I'm talking about us. I don't know how the other states work. So uh, from a strategy perspective, it's ideal to take step two. From an application perspective, we would look at your entire package to make a determination about interviews and going forward from there. Awesome. And Stacey, we, we were having this conversation uh, offline uh, because there's a lot of conversations uh, happening across the country in regards to the supplemental application. Uh, some specialties are using, others aren't. Some people are really um, you know, uh, some programs or residency uh, residency specialties are really engaged in this process. Where, where does ORL fall when it comes to uh, the supplemental application? So currently, at least for the current application cycle, there's no plan to include a supplemental application. Um, it's a conversation that continues to come up, and I'm sure will next year again, but for this year, we are not planning to utilize it. So we may be back having the same conversation in a year yes. with a different answer. <laughs> I'm sure we will. And Sharuk, um, uh, thoughts about the interview process? Um, uh, has your specialty committed to being virtual or in-person or hybrid? Uh, and if they are going to be virtual, what should students to prepare for that process? So I don't think we have the answer to that. As Dr. Gray alluded earlier, we look at the Society of University Ordering Gologists to, uh, to give us guidance on that separately. So there are two parts to it. One is our society, and the second is uh, obviously institutional uh, policies. So right now we haven't been given a clear cut guidance, even from the BI, the DMC, um, GME office. Uh, but again, we will be looking at this. And I think this is a, a process and evolution, which hopefully we'll find out by the fall as to which way we're going. Um, maybe St Dr. Gray, you have any better idea from the SUO perspective? So um, we're in the middle of conversations right now um, at, over the next couple of weeks. And I, so, and I will just mention a few things just because I think for students, and it's important to understand the complexity of this conversation, because the same way there are pros and cons with away sub eyes, there are a lot of pros and cons with virtual interviews. And we're really trying to think about it very thoughtfully. For our program, MGB, which Mass General Brigham is sort of our, um, our 
big hospital system and they have basically come out with a statement within the last few days saying that um, it really will be virtual interviews unless the specialty actually has a conflicting statement and then we have to apply to actually go against um, the rest of MGB. So my suspicion is for our specific program, we will be doing things virtually this year. Um, I think we all recognize that um, there, the positives about virtual interviews are especially on the applicant side. So the um, ability to sort of decrease cost and time away from your program and also our suspicion is that that actually really helps from the standpoint of DEI. So I don't think there's any question about that, that that is really one of the reasons that programs really want to continue in that vein. On the other hand, for small surgical subspecialties, they're especially for programs that are smaller programs and are not in major um, cities, there is a significant concern that there is actually, um, that that really disadvantages those programs because if the program is in um, a part of the country that you might not have otherwise visited and it's a small program with only one or two residents in a year, they really feel that the in-person ability to interview really showcases the program in a way that they can't do virtually. And so that's really the conversation on a national level that's happening right now is how to be fair, mm -hmm. fairest to everyone. And I don't think we have a great answer. We also don't have data about all of the students that matched virtually over the last couple of years and making sure they really were actually happy with their choice. And I think we're all waiting to kind of hear about that a little bit too. So it's a, it's a tough situation. And I think we really are trying to do the right thing, both for programs and also for, uh, for applicants to try to make it um, really the, the most beneficial for both parties. Awesome. I'm um, sticking with you, Stacey. One thing that happens often is that students feel compelled to write a thank you letter or to send an email um, after applying. Um, I actually have heard that some programs actually discourage students from doing so. Um, where are you at when it comes to this post application, post interview communication? So I actually say at the very beginning of the interviews that that we really don't want students to do that. We're not we don't discourage it, but we basically say it is absolutely not a requirement. And in the past, especially like when I applied, I like literally wrote small little, you know, I'm from the South. This is like this is like part of my upbringing. Like you write a handwritten thank you note on your personalized stationery to every single person that you met. And it's, it was exhaust, it was exhausting even at that time. So probably 15 years ago, I started telling students like, we really don't want you to do that. You're meeting with 14 people today. We do not want you to write 14 thank you letters at all. Like save trees, save your hand. There's no reason to do that. Um, we don't want to discourage people for post interview communications, meaning asking questions, especially if we're interviewing early in the process and you might have questions that come up later. So one of the ways that we have gotten around that is really providing them the email um, contact information for our residents that sit on our interview committee so that I think the students are very comfortable reaching out to them to ask questions, um, but without having to really sort of worry about saying thank yous. The other thing that I always say is that that can become awkward as program director because the you you cannot let the let applicants know, for instance, how you're thinking about ranking them. That's like a big no-no. And so I that's the other thing I say at the beginning of the of the interview day is that if you do email me, I love to hear that. I love that you loved our program. I love to hear if you're ranking it highly, but I'm going to send you the most awkward, weird email back that basically you're going to be like, what does this mean? But I'm telling you now, it means absolutely nothing. It's the same email that I send to every student. I feel horrible doing it and we can laugh about it later, but that's what we have to do as a program because we really comply with the rules of the match. And, I, and all programs really should be doing that, obviously. Awesome. Uh, and thank you for giving people the heads up now. So if they receive that awkward email, they know. All right, so we're at the end of our program and I just wanna ask both of you, and I'll start with you, Sharuk, first. Any other piece of advice, anything that we did not talk about that you think students need to learn uh, or know before applying to ORL or specifically applying to your residency program? I mean, for the first part, uh, knowing about ordering Oji, just uh, make sure you have some uh, some experience to see what ordering Oji is all about. It is a very diverse specialty. It's probably the most diverse specialty uh, in in the body. We 
pretty much regional uh, uh, surgeons who take care of everything in the head and neck kind of thing. Uh, that's why our specialty is otorhinology, head, neck surgery. So that's number one. Know a good reason why you're doing this. Um, separately from uh, other things for application perspective, I think we've talked about it several times. Uh, make sure you identify a mentor, as Dr. Gray said. Uh, make sure as you're getting collecting your letters of reference, it's very important to uh, to be really honest with whoever your letter writers are that they can write you a good letter or a strong letter uh, versus someone you've just had a conversation with once and they will not be able to advocate on your behalf. So be careful with what, what you're choosing. Uh, otherwise, from a program uh, uh, information, I think we've already talked about there's many ways uh, interacting uh, with faculty variously, virtually or so forth, uh, getting in touch with the residents, um, I think are, are good, good ways. And then if you can visit somewhere, I think that's not a bad idea. Again, that's all governed by the policies of that institution and residency program. Uh, so I think that's uh, all I can say, uh, add to this. Awesome. Uh, and for you, Dr. Gray, any other parting comments that you have? So I think that, you know, one of the things is just, again, the importance of mentorship, which I've already said, but I think one of the things is that students can feel overwhelmed with the whole process and they don't, and sometimes it can feel like the world is working against you and that things are so hard. There are all these um, hoops that you have to jump through to be able to join this field. It's really not intended to be that way. What we're trying to do in the whole point of the match process is um, like Dr. Jalisi mentioned, we want it to be a good match, a good fit, and not every program is the same. So we're really trying to fit, we're as programs have been doing this a really, really long time. And we actually do have a pretty good sense of what students are gonna do the best in our environment. So you don't wanna be a square peg in a round hole. And that's why it's so important to have good conversations with your mentors because you really want to go to the program, you are absolutely going to thrive. And so that might be a little different than what you think you want. And so having those really, those really good conversations with your mentor as you're going through the process, I think really helps to make sure that you end up being in the right environment for you, which is going to be totally different for every single student that's, that's watching this. And it's our job to help you come to that understanding and feel comfortable with that. Awesome. Uh, I want to say thank you to Dr. Gray, Dr. Jalisi for being here. Uh, this was really informative. Uh, I learned a lot about your specialty uh, and uh, the application process. So thank you for contributing uh, an hour of your day to be here with us. Um, there is a quick poll that we're going to pop up. Um, and please take note of the upcoming events. On the 21st, we have our webinar series on radiology, and then we're going to close out with urology. Um, a couple of very important websites uh, that you can go to uh, to learn more about both our visiting clerkship program and then also other events that we're going to be having in general with the DICP. Uh, thank you all for participating and uh, everyone have a good rest of your afternoon and we look forward to seeing you on uh, the interview trail come uh, this, uh, this upcoming fall. Take care, everyone. Thank you. And again, thank you, Dr. Gray and Dr. Jalisi.